let's move on to Dr. Kim's presentation and then we'll leave whatever time we have over to discuss. Uh, also input from you, Dr. Meng, and uh, we can also reflect back on what we've already heard from Dr. Berkeley. So uh, if you will, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, we're listening. Thank you very much uh, to the World Knowledge Forum and to uh, my, my two preceding speakers, um, Dr. Berkeley and Dr. Meng, for their very insightful presentations. This will focus primarily on COVID-19 vaccine development. So as we say, upstream of where uh, Dr. Berkeley was addressing the, the problems with manufacturing and delivery uh, of vaccines around the world. Will, will COVID-19 become like one of those other common cold viruses uh, that Professor Meng was talking about? And we really don't know that. One of the things that works in our favor, and one of the things that argues that the current set of vaccines may protect against subsequent uh, strains is that the amount of variation in the genetic information of COVID-19 is 10 times less than is found in flu, in a single year of flu. And it's thousands of times less than is seen in a single year of variation that's generated from in HIV. So hopefully this lack of uh, variation in the genome of SARS-CoV-2 will mean that the vaccines that we develop today actually with strains that were originally isolated in January and February, will continue to protect human populations as we roll out um, the vaccines that are proven to be safe and effective. The third question that, that often comes up is, okay, so we understand now that maybe people can't be reinfected well, with COVID-19, but what protective or immune responses are critical in mediating that protection? Is it uh, neutralizing antibody, that is proteins that are made by the body that are very specific for COVID-19 that bind to and inactivate the virus? Or is it, as Professor Meng said, is it that uh, we call it T-cell mediated immunity, killer cells, cells that kill virally infected cells? And at this point, we don't really know. Um, we suspect that both of them are important. Most vaccine developers look at neutralizing antibody and you'll find that if you ever uh, see a report, uh, a press release or, or of a paper being published in a prestigious journal, they'll often focus on the neutralizing antibody. And, and all of the vaccines that are currently in phase three testing all generate some level of neutralizing antibody. Um, but importantly, there are differences. Our, the next question is, are the animal models predictive? So, you know, in, in diseases where we don't have a good animal model, for instance, HIV, it is very difficult uh, to use the animals to screen vaccines. And it's re really convenient, it, it makes, research and vaccine development faster if we can take the virus like COVID-19 and infect another animal species. So we know we can infect um, certain types of mice that are um, genetically altered. We know that we can easily infect ferrets and minks. We know that we can infect monkeys and, and golden hamsters uh, with COVID-2. And in some cases, the, the animals get very sick and in some cases die. So that when we use a vaccine, we can vaccinate a monkey, for instance, with a, with a test a candidate vaccine, if that monkey can be protected, then we have, again, um, some presumptive evidence that vaccine development may be possible. And in the case of the currently existing COVID vaccines, all of the vaccines currently in phase three have a demonstration or proof of concept that they prevent infection in monkeys. So again, suggestive evidence. Now, Dr. David Weiner, who is a professor at Penn and the Wistar, um, says, just remember that mice lie Monkeys exaggerate and only humans tell the truth. So we really are going to have to wait for those critical human trials. The final question is, are there safety concerns? And, and it's possible. Um, suggestions from other coronaviruses and including the SARS-CoV-1 uh, raise the possibility that there may be very unique uh, immunological problems that could develop uh, in response to vaccination. The good news is, if there's any good news around COVID-19, that we haven't seen it yet in any of the studies that have been done in ferrets, in hamsters, or in non-human primates, in, in monkeys. So again, maybe those won't occur with SARS-CoV-2, but only the human testing will tell us, and it really does commit us to, um, to watching safety in human clinical trials. We often talk about the, the time it takes to develop a vaccine. Under normal circumstances, five to 10 years. It costs 500 million to one and a half billion dollars to make a new vaccine. The failure rate from license to um, from laboratory to license from the beginning here at discovery to the end here um, authorization to market the vaccine is 93%. So only one in 10 vaccines make it from the laboratory all the way to the finish line. In the middle of this, we have the what we call preclinical testing, testing in animals. 
Um, we enter uh, human clinical testing. So we've done phase one, which are safety trials. Um, for many COVID vaccines, they are now in phase two, which is really looking at whether the vaccine generates the right protective responses, immune responses, in what we call the target population. If this is for the entire population, then we have to test it in, in healthy adults, 18 to 65, but we importantly have to test it in people older than 65 and people under 18. Um, because this vaccine is really meant for, for everybody. And finally, if we're convinced by the phase two data, we move on into phase three, which looks at safety and efficacy. Now, all of that can occur over five to 10 years, but we are going to have to compress all of that into six to 18 months. And how does that happen? And so you see a schematic here of what happens in a five-year development cycle. You know, we start in the upper part of the panel in preclinical, that is testing in animals. We move to the first trial in humans, which looks at safety. And after that's done, you know, usually it takes six to 12 months, we look at the safety and we say, ah, this is good. We can test it in phase two, which looks at the production of correct immune responses as well as safety. And that is often an, another year of development. Uh, we analyze the data and if everything looks right, then we proceed with the most ex expensive phase, phase three, which looks at efficacy. Does the vaccine protect against infection or disease? And is the vaccine safe? And if we're convinced by those data, then the company uh, moves the product forward and asks, for instance, in the US, the FDA and Korea, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety for approval uh, of the vaccine so that they can now sell the vaccine. Advantage of the five-year development cycle is we have five years to look at safety. And the difference, which is what you see on the bottom panel, is a, an imaginary one-year development cycle. So we start and we do the animal testing at roughly the same time that we're doing the human testing, the phase one human clinical trial. After the final dose is administered to the final volunteer in phase one, we look quickly at safety. If there are no safety signals, then we start phase two. Now phase one is continuing and will continue for six to 12 months, but we move immediately into phase two. And again, after phase two is started, after the final dose in the, in the members of, um, of volunteers who are participating in phase two, then we quickly analyze safety, look at whether the right immune responses are being done and we start phase three. And in some cases, at least for SARS-CoV-2, we're skipping the immunogenicity phase and moving immediately into phase three, reporting the immunogenicity later. But finally, in the final analysis, the same things that would be required for a vaccine to be approved in the United States or in Korea, safety and efficacy, will be looked at uh, for uh, vaccines licensed for COVID-19. In fact, the endpoints, the things that are gonna matter, does the vaccine protect against infection and disease, will likely be fairly similar comparing the five to 10 year development to the six to 18 month development. The thing that we won't have as much information on is the longer term safety question. And you know, will that be important? Well, I think again, the good news is that most um, adverse events, uh, side effects occur within the first 14 days after vaccination. Um, Typically, almost all of them occur within the first two months. So we should have that very critical safety information, but there could be longer term question and that will really have to commit drug companies, um, governments that are sponsoring research to follow volunteers for a longer period of time to ensure that no long term safety signals are seen. So how are you going to do this? How are you going to take what a company normally does in five to 10 years at a cost of uh, one billion dollars? Uh, and with a 93% failure rate and convince them that really it's in their interest to do this in a shorter time frame. And you do that by helping them to de-risk the process. And how do you de-risk a process? You give them funding. So if you look, this is the Operation Warp Speed, the US government's program for rapidly developing a COVID-19 vaccine. And what you see in the first, uh, in the column with the first, the first column with numbers in it, is the amount of money that the US government is giving to the companies in order to develop vaccines, $10.3 billion, a huge amount of money to help them defray the cost of development, to help them de-risk it. What's shown in the next column are the number of doses that the United States government has asked them to start making or has approved the purchase of. And so that by the time a vaccine is shown to be safe and effective, the US government could actually have hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine already ready with an option to purchase more. The US government is not the only player here though, an organization called CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and they'll come in later because they're participating in the COVAX mechanism, 
also has $1.4 billion. And I think the good news about CEPI is, and Korea is a member of CEPI, CEPI, when it gave money to, to many of these companies early on in the pandemic, before even the US government gave money, asked the companies to sign a global access agreement and agreed to sell the vaccine at a reasonable price. So again, to accelerate, we de-risk and we de-risk by providing funding uh, for research and development. So I'm not gonna go through this, Dr. Uh, Berkeley really mentioned that there are over 180 different candidates in development. What you see here are the different types. And actually this is a very uh, recent slide from Wikipedia. Um, there are 35 human clinical trials, uh, currently ongoing, nine phase three trials. We've made tremendous progress considering what would normally be a five to 10 year development cycle. We're now in phase three for nine of the, the different vaccines, really remarkable. It's actually easier to see on this slide because this slide shows you, for instance, for Moderna, when the first dose was given to humans, which was March 17th of this year, uh, when the first data were available, which is uh, near the end of April, uh, when advanced, uh, when later stage trials, in this case, phase two, uh, and eventually phase three, uh, which started on the 27th of July, uh, were initiated. And finally, in the hatched area, when the company intends to start production of the vaccine at risk. So again, you can see that there will be some vaccines being manufactured before the end of 2020. The World Knowledge Forum.